we started working with young people. So um, all of this was relatively unexpected. Um, it, it was it came from the success of one project um, alone, which is Haircuts by Children. That was a project that we did in um, 2006. Very simple project. Work with a bunch of kids, get them trained as hairstylists, uh, rent a salon, put them to work in the salon, pay them above minimum wage, um, and then uh, they do haircuts on the public. So we train them. Um, and uh, do the do pretty standard kind of training over the course of a week, only so that they get good enough to do that. Which it, it would be nice if the, the contrast was a little bit better. You can see that's I, that's a very common haircut that they provide. I call that the the Odessa step sequence because they <laughs> like to make steps there. Um, this is a guy getting his name. Uh, chopped into his head there. Hugh is his name. So it starts out okay with kind of an H and then it goes right off the fucking rails there. <laughs> so the thing about haircuts by the thing about haircuts by children was that it, it it was first sort of designed to be this anar sort of anarchic kind of crazy intervention um, into a salon and and um, it was actually inspired by Gustavo Ortigas's project Rules of the Game where he had um, two soccer soccer uh, teams from uh, Mexico and two basketball teams from uh, America high school teams play each other in the same space at the same time um, and it just I wanted to capture some kind of the, the chaos and the fun of working with young people. The thing is what what happened with it that was really unexpected and a lot of this stuff has been unexpected the the results of the projects are unexpected and then we take the unexpected thing and then try to make another project based on that so the unexpected thing with this was was how hard the kids wanted to work and succeed how frightened that they would they were that they were gonna fuck up um, and then the really really unexpected thing was the beautiful relationship that occurred between the adult and the child um, an adult and a child who didn't know each other who had no sort of there were I was awkward it was uncomfortable there was no familiarity at all and how they had to reach across this kind of divide uh, the social divide to become friends and trust each other for that moment in a, in a society, and this is you know a ph phenomenon that that you know goes European society, British society, Australian, American, just this stranger danger thing that we all have to deal with, which is which is actually quite quite a bit um, exaggerated. Um, there's a researcher, um, uh, what's his name? He wrote a book called How to Live Dangerously. Uh, I forget his name now. Uh, uh, and he, what he, anyway, what he, um, what he showed by looking at at the stats around abductions was that if you wanted your child to be abducted, if you really wanted that to happen, and you put your kid out on the street um, and waited for somebody to come and abduct them, to abduct them, you'd have to wait 600,000 years before that would happen. That's how unlikely it is. And if you wanted them to be killed, then it gets up into the millions. So it's actually quite uh, a safe world that we live in. Um, so. We were sort of surprised by the beauty of this, and that it was actually observed by Diane Borsato, who's an artist, um, a Canadian, a Toronto-based artist. Um, she was claimed to be almost moved to tears by the the intimacy of, for that of, in that project. So we started to kind of look at that a little bit, um, and then what we did next was. Um, uh, the fun that we had with that project was so great um, that we wanted to continue to work and we were working with a school in the neighborhood that I live in, Parkdale Public School, so we wanted to do a bunch of projects, so did a whole series of projects there um, uh, that we called Parkdale Public School versus Queen West. Now Queen West, as you may know, is this rapidly gentrifying artsy fartsy area. Um, Parkdale is there and it's it's home to um, a lot of apartment buildings, a lot of tower apartment buildings that have um, a lot of refugees, um, Hungarian, Roma refugees these days, but Sri Lankan refugees, Tibetan refugees, um, Vietnamese refugees from um, more toward the 70s, um, and they're not going anywhere. Those buildings are not. They're not going to be. They, they're not going to be gentrified. That to gentrify them would would require a kind of resources that that nobody has, and and the the kind of regulation around being able to kick people out is is strong enough to protect those buildings from gentrification. So that population stays there, and then there's this other population that's coming in, artsy fartsy people, um, people like myself, and so we wanted to create a sort of collision between these two populations. Um, so we did all of these projects and just a list a few of them. We did 10 over the course of the year. Show and Tell was, a, was just a video that we made with every single uh, kid in the school. Uh, there's about 546 kids that we all just asked to bring in their favorite object and we shot this video of just them explaining what their favorite object was. Um, Parkdale Public School versus Blocks Recording 
was uh, worked with the Blocks Recording, which is a uh, recording a co-op, like a music label, and uh, Bob Wiseman is on it, and so the Senior Strings class uh, did a bunch of uh, songs with those guys, with Bob, uh, with the phonemes, uh, and with uh, Kids on TV. I don't know if we have a photo. No, we don't. Um, and so and then we, that was presented at the at the Gladstone Hotel. Uh, they presented their work there, and there were happy mothers in the audience. Another one that came out of that um, that I'll spend a little bit more time with uh, describing is the Children's Choice Awards, which was at first was just a, a sort of small intervention into the Alley Jaunt, which is a, a, a an art show that happens in Toronto or used to happen around Trinity Bellwoods Park in the garages around there. Uh, people would um, uh, show work in the garages, and they would pe people who were not artists would open up uh, their garage for people to to install their work, and it would just happen over the course of the weekend. And I organized a group of kids from Park. Dill um, to go check out this work uh, and then give out awards at the end, determining the awards based on their own their own interests. Um, so that project got expanded and now is one of the tour or touring projects. Haircuts by Children is also a touring project. We've toured that to um, probably yeah, approaching now 40 cities, usually usually in theater or performing arts festivals. Things like Luminato would be the kind of scale that we're talking about, and with this too. So the Children's Choice Awards is an intervention into a large-scale performing arts festival where uh, we'll work with young people in a given area. And we have a kind of stipulation that when we're working in these, when we're doing this kind of work, is that we ask for, to work with populations who are not um, represented in the sort of creative city script. So with this is from the Kunsten Festival des Arts, this photo, which is in... Um, uh, Brussels, and uh, so in that case, these kids are mostly the, the children of, uh, of Moroccan immigrants. Um, and then when we do it, uh, say in Germany, the the young people will uh, they they tend to be the children of the Turkish guest workers that were brought uh, over in the sort of mid century 60s, 70s. Um, and and we we just ask that that generally the rule is the children of immigrants immigrants themselves or anybody who's not sort of part of that, uh, the Creative City script, who's not the ones who are normally attending these kinds of events or the, 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 the children of, of people who are not, uh, we don't want to work with people who are sort of commonly going there. Um, and, and they just see a bunch of work and then they have talks with the artists, there's a bunch of kids talking to Robert Wilson, um, the opera director and performer. Um, and it's it's a really interesting project, sorry to say that, but it is. Um, um, and what's interesting about it is the fact that um, a lot of people misunderstand our intentions and think it's for the edification of the children and the children are supposed to become cultured and that kind of thing. But actually we use this concept called stealth pedagogy which is it's actually for the edification of the adults. Um, and the festivals and the, and the artists in the festivals and the audience at the festivals and to help them wrap their heads around how to accommodate children as, as more or less equals or at least accommodate them. In this case we're rolling out the red carpet and we're trying to make them um, for a moment uh, and again using performance or performativity as as we're trying to sort of make this fake world that doesn't really exist, but we can feel what it might be like if it exists. And we get a lot of pushback. We get a lot of pushback from the artists who um, are not so comfortable with one of our asks, which is when um, their show starts, what we ask is the audience is allowed in, the audience sits down, um, but we hold the kids back. And once the audience is seated, then we want an announcement that, that the uh, kids are coming in. Now, if you're a theater artist, which is probably, are there any theater artists here? No, probably not. Yeah, a couple. Yeah. So you know that that the for somebody to have another project right before you do your show in your show where there's an announcement that announces this other artist whose whose project is happening during your project um, is a, that's a big generous thing for people to do for us and most people do other people there's been some fights with people an interesting thing happened with Tim Crouch who's a British um, uh, uh, actor writer kind of guy he does a lot of stuff where he talks to the audience and he'll start uh, with this project or with the show that he did that we came to see. He started talking as the audience came in and started and he engaged with the kids and talked to the kids and they talked back. Um, and then he started to show and of course the, the ordinary rules of, of theater um, spectatorship kind of clicked into gear except that the kids didn't know that the, new, that the rules had changed. They kept talking to him um, and they kept wanting to engage with him because he had sort of set up that, that, uh, that principle there and they it, they they pissed him off and uh, he didn't allow us when we were in another festival doing the same project in Vancouver this time um, he wouldn't allow us to come and see the show because we had pissed him off. The other thing that happens is we get in a lot of conflicts with the teachers. Um, 
because we often work with schools and there's a lot of interesting kind of um, uh, fertile ground there just because of of, uh, of what how children are expected to, to operate in schools and there's the expectation that we're teaching them how to be cultural consumers and that they're supposed to be quiet and and uh, behave in, in that kind of way um, but we're we're more interested in in the young people behaving however the hell they want and running around the lobbies and 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 um, we expect that if anybody's made uncomfortable by that that they will communicate that to the kids themselves and we leave that responsibility up to the adults and we don't intervene um, and in fact we've we've did, to, I've written a protocol called the Mammalian Protocol for collaborating with um, children, which is based on the UN Conventions on the Rights of the Child, which pulls out the articles that are relevant to our particular practice. So, um, the you know Article 12, the right to freedom of expression, uh, simply means that you can't shush a child. You cannot tell them to be quiet if they're if they're getting on your nerves. You have to explain to them why their noise is bothering you, and then and then you have to negotiate with them. The other one, uh, freedom of association, is an important one. So, if you have two kids who are you know, having a good time together, the sort of traditional way of dealing with that is to separate them. Um, that's not allowed. You cannot separate kids. Um, they're, they're, they have a right to associate with whoever they want. Um, so, so that's caused us some conflict. There was an interesting, sorry about that. There was um, uh, something that happened in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Brussels, actually, where um, the, really early on the teacher yanked the project because she was, I think, I think our feeling was is two things were going on. One, she couldn't explain the work. This is we're taking them to festivals where the 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 it's con contemporary theater performance. So sometimes it's terrible, you know, in that really kind of contemporary art kind of way, which is like it's you know completely impenetrable um, and boring as fucking shit. Um, but it's really fun to sit with ten kids who are bored out of their skulls um, watching, and you're bored too, and you just don't understand why we all have to be here. But it's fun anyway. Um, but the teacher was a bit threatened by, I think, she couldn't explain the work. That's one thing, as you may know, and maybe some of you are teachers too, one of the things you have to be really careful as an artist working with teachers is that, is that especially a cool teacher, that you don't steal their cool. Um, and that can be easy to do if you're, if you're there temporarily and you're kind of like the cool uncle that comes in and, and has way more freedom um, and doesn't have the principal to sort of answer to. So you have to be careful. And I think we may have stolen a little bit of her cool was one thing. And then the third thing was that... Um, um, I think it was a French school with mostly white kids, uh, and the other schools were Moroccan schools, and I kind of sensed that she wasn't happy about this in, this mingling, and the Moroccan kids were a little bit, I think they may have been, um, they were, seemed a bit older to me, and they were, they were kind of a little bit more rock and roll, and so there was a bit of weirdness there. So she yanked the project, um, and then that got us into an interesting situation where we just called up all of the parents and said, well we can still come into the school and pick your kid up and we can still do the project. We don't need the school to do the project. And the first uh, parent said, well, what are the other parents uh, doing? And we said, well, they're all doing the project. Um, and then the second uh, parent asked the same question. We gave the same answer. And then eventually the answer was true. Um, all the kids did the project, including, by the way, the principal's son which was kind of a little bit uh, confusing for us that the principal's son remained in the project, but yet the teacher pulled out, uh, pulled all of the students out. So um, then what started to happen was the teacher started to assign unprecedented amounts of homework um, to the kids so that she was taxing them. So they were trying to like stay up late to see these shows and she was giving them, these are like, they were 10 year old kids, right? Um, and they recognized the injustice. Um, they recognized that she wasn't being very nice to them, um, but they were kind of philosophical about it. And then when it came to um, the, the show, and what we do is we have an award ceremony at the end where the kids give out uh, trophies that are dipped in chocolate and we place the microphone at the level of the children, not at the level that's comfortable for adults. And we have performances. Um, and um, what happened was a couple of the kids were, wanted to do this dance, were planning to do a dance, and they wanted to do a dance that they had, they had uh, worked up with their teacher. And another one of the, the children said, no, no, we can't do that dance because Mademoiselle so-and-so doesn't like this project and she wouldn't be happy if we were to do that uh, dance. And, it, and at that point it just struck me as how amazing it was that the kids had more kind of uh, more st stronger ethics than, than their teacher did who had been sort of taxing them with all this homework. They were more fair to her than she had been to them. Um, and that just sort of spoke to, to, to how sophisticated children you know, often are, obviously, as, as, as probably everybody in here knows. Um, another project that came out of this whole thing was Eat the Street, which is um, related to that. Um, except we go to we go to restaurants and we eat in restaurants uh, with a jury of young people and the audience moment uh, and that's and the young people eat food that they've never seen before and they don't really understand why it's like that um, and neither do I um, 
so um, they, um, the audience moment is you come and you have have dinner with these kids and you have this um, uh, this meal and and you're you're uh, uh, you watch this jury in action is kind of how we promote it. But really, the thing about it is, and the thing that we're kind of stealthily doing is it's it's a dinner between adults and children who don't know each other who are going out for dinner together and and having a good time and having a conversation. And you can see they're pretty young; they're ten between ten and twelve years old, um, and they they hang out. And sometimes it's awkward and sometimes it's weird and but you know, people often, or almost always, will always make this effort to to connect across this sort of um, divide. Um, so that's that's sort of how we started. We started doing these projects, and we're obviously just sort of flipping the dynamic and putting children in a in a position of a little more, um, not authority, but um, just sort of a little bit of more central position within within uh, the kind of social uh, landscape and uh, pro providing a situation where young people and adults can spend some time with each other and get to know each other. Um, and like I said, this stuff all was sort of seeded first in Parkdale, Toronto, where I live. Um, and what started to happen was because of the success of haircuts, uh, the uh, Children's Choice and, and Eat the Street, which are all now uh, projects that we tour um, internationally, because of the success of that, we started to lose touch with Toronto and started to lose touch in particular with these young people. And that was frustrating for us, and, and but it was hard to figure out how to what to do um, with that. Uh, additionally, just as a, as a side note, there was also one of the problems, interestingly, that we had was the fact that m my sort of personal career, but the, even the company's, the company's history was making work for adults that was very adult. Um, and uh, and it's, you know, like make-out parties and um, other kinds of related things like that and, and enough sexuality and enough swearing and all that kind of thing so that when we made the switch, a lot of people got a little bit freaked out and uh, a little bit uh, uncomfortable and there was a little bit of sensational journalism about it specifically focusing on me and it damaged the relationship with Parkdale at the time. I think we're sort of slowly building it up with the, with the school in particular. They got a little bit freaked out. Um, uh, so we've, we sort of had to ne negotiate that. But what happened in 2010 was that um, we got, um, we were uh, one of the young people that we had worked with on Eat the Street got in touch with us and just asked what was happening uh, now. And um, we hadn't uh, made any plans to make anything happen. We didn't have the resources. And that was another thing is that selling the work on the road became kind of a priority so that we could make some money. Um, and uh, so we started to work you know, very sort of gently and very casually with uh, this this one, Sanjay Ratnan is his name. He brought in Kathy Vu, who's his friend. Uh, they brought in Narupa Somasali. Uh, and, and then there was a the day before we had our first meeting, I bumped into another kid that we'd been working with and invited him, uh, Cho Chosang Tenzin, and his friend Chosen Tenzin. Um, and then they, over the course of the next few months, we started to, we made a video first, and that's a production still from the video. Um, and then just sort of made the resolution that any time we did any work in Toronto, we would work with these same young people, um, and that 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 the rule was if we had a Toronto work that was going on, then it had to include them, and that could range anything from um, an artistic work to me speaking on a panel. Um, they will they will come, and in a case in a case like that, I'll take. Um, I'll take 10% uh, of the fee to pay for their bus tickets and stuff like that, and then they get to split the rest of, of the fee. So um, that started in 2010. Some of the projects that we did, um, Networking 101 was a, a project that we did for the AGYU, uh, the Art Gallery of York University, which has a bus to take people up because on opening nights they want to they wanna fill the audience, and so they have performance artists uh, activate the buses. So we started to work. We, we did, With that one, we um, just brought the young people, there's uh, Cho Seng Tenzin there, and um, we just asked all the adults, our performance was to ask all the adults on the bus to to circulate around the bus, sit with the young people, and tell us what kind of skills that they could offer our new collective. Um, we wanted, we were, it was just networking, we wanted to know what, what do you do, what kind of skills can you offer us, and how can we build an artistic community together uh, collaboratively with these young people. And through that we met Anupa uh, Pereira, who's now our resident cellist. Um, we never thought we needed a cellist before that, but meeting her we realized that a cellist was actually perfect, and so uh, now when we need a cellist we have Anupa, and we, we create project so that she has um, uh, an opportunity to play her cello and she's very good. Um, so um, Night Walks with Teenagers was another project um, and this project came out of the fact that um, whenever we would go see it, we'd do an event and we'd hang out somewhere like a, uh, we'd go to 
to power plant or we would go to harbor front to see something or we'd go downtown um, they would always insist on on walking back to Parkdale which really surprised me just around the idea that young people are not active um, and and they wouldn't want to do something like that but they insisted on walking home and it became obvious that it was you know just the the fun of of a night walk out on a Saturday night a kind of psychogeographic kind of uh, derive uh, uh, der derivate just walking through the street and so we designed a project called Night Walks with Teenagers where we would just offer all of these teenagers if you want to come and walk around the city really aimlessly with a bunch of teenagers here they are um, so we did that project in Leeds um, as part of the Performance Studies International Conference we did it in, uh, at, in Cape Breton in Nova Scotia where we did a uh, beach walk forest walk and city walk um, and there's some um, uh, Cape Breton kids and there's our guys um, and we would try to find young people in each location that we're doing it. We're going to be doing it maybe in Germany and then definitely in Birmingham coming up um, and then in Brighton or yeah I think Brighton um, next year um, and that was just another sort of another project to be breaking boundaries adults young people sort of talking together and and hanging around and getting to know each other um, and then just the sort of fun of, of, of being together I'll get back to how that project came to be in terms of our process, but um, just to sort of point out that it's that it, it was it was watching them um, that that sort of led to it. it um, watching what their own desires were, um, and then trying to formalize it a little bit. A uh, Darenite is another project that we did um, over the course of uh, a year, uh, where we would have these Darenites where where the um, Torontonians, which is the collective that we formed, would would host a, a night of dares. Uh, adults would come in and do the dares. This guy ate something hot. This guy stuck a tampon up his nose. This woman had to lick an armpit. Um, and then throughout, scattered throughout the dares are, um, are fake dares that the young people pull out that actually are performances. So uh, sing um, I Believe in Miracles by Hot Chocolate and that's been rehearsed and we sort of bust out with that. Um, and the, the thing with this particular uh, project and, and all of the things are, are all trying to sort of address is, is to try to, to, try to um, make connections between the young people and um, and particularly Queen Street West because that's their neighborhood. Um, there's all of this activity going on, all of this arts artsy activity and so we try to create partnerships with the various organizations there so the young people start to become conversant with these organizations and then um, the and then the, the adults there get to know them and then hopefully will develop um, you know relationships collaborative relationships in the future um, the same is true the same is a little bit true in the with the children's choice awards wanting in um, let's say in, in Brussels or wherever we're doing it so that the young people start to understand that these buildings where all of this cultural stuff happens they're welcome in those buildings in fact they were there at one point where there was a red carpet and they were welcome into those buildings um, they they felt that they were loved in those buildings um, and that um, and that there's they're accepted and that, that they belong there and these buildings are have, have honored them and they're they're welcome there to what extent that is something that is actually going to play out over the course of time I can't predict probably not as much as uh, I would like but it's it's a, a suggestion of something again uh, as Steve mentioned it's like a, a performance of something that might actually have some traction a little bit um, dare night lockdown was a culmination of uh, something that we did um, where the first thing we did rather than focusing on um, like many youth arts uh, kind of programming rather than focusing on um, artistic like workshops which which is sort of often the case where um, young people will be invited to express themselves through artistic means um, instead of doing that the first formal stuff that we did with them was was not artistic at all it was um, it was a, a long-term residency at the Gladstone Hotel to learn about the different aspects of production event production so that was the first thing that we got some you know that we wrote a grant for and the first thing that we asked them to show up regularly um, and the first official thing that that um, that they were actually compensated for a little bit in a more kind of official way um, and we brought in people like um, Julian Sleeth, who's the man who runs um, uh, Nuit Blanche. Uh, we brought in Naomi Campbell, who is at Luminato, uh, producer at Luminato. Um, we brought in people around marketing and um, uh, production uh, technical aspects, and so th and and we worked together over the course of the year um, for the young with the young people to design their own uh, event, which was a culmination of the Dare Nights, and it was called Dare Night Lockdown. Um, and Dare Night Lockdown um, featured the the um, the same sort of dare thing, only it started at 
eight o'clock and it went until the next day and the Gladstone Hotel where we did it they allowed all of these 16 year olds to spend the entire night sleeping in the hotel in the on the floor in the in the ballroom uh, and people did theirs that's a uh, Toronto District School Board teacher Marie Axler who's also a former mammalian board member um, she's calling one of the kids friends and leaving on the kids answering machine the sound of herself having an orgasm um, or faking an orgasm um, that's a dare designed by the young people. Um, and that's another rule we have, which is, again, freedom of expression. They, whatever they want, uh, as long as it's not illegal, uh, whatever they want goes. Um, uh, sort of stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure what's happening there, but there, she's reading a dare. And then intermittent dances, uh, uh, other dares like that, tape on your nipple getting ripped off. Um, and then uh, sleeping over, spending the entire night. Um, and this one... This started. To, we started to change gears at this point. The interesting, sorry about that. The thing with um, these young people, um, which is really interesting, I think, is that they didn't want. Um, so there's about 15 of them that became part of this collective, and we wanted to build it out a bit more. And they were really adamant that they didn't want their friends to be part of it. Um, even their closest friends, they didn't want their friends to be part of it. And they were really transparent about it, is because they had this really cool elite little club um, that was, you know, managed to make them some money now and again. And and they really wanted to keep that. And we really <laughs> wanted to share it. Um, so we had to negotiate with them, and we've continued to negotiate with them. And this one's really really tricky. Um, and what they've agreed to is that um, they've agreed to the rationale. They understand why we have to build this out and why it can't just remain um, these uh, 15 young people, particularly um, since we wanted to keep this going for a while, and I'll get into that in a bit. But um, And we expect an attrition rate. You know, They're not going to be interested in hanging around doing this stuff forever, so we need to sort of build it out. So what they agreed to is that we can start to work with young people from other neighborhoods um, as long as it, they weren't their, their immediate friends. And I mean, at first it was really baffling and, and, and really kind of made me mad and I thought they were selfish and stupid. But, um, but then it occurred to me, if I was doing a project with somebody and then suddenly, you know, unilaterally they brought in, you know, one of my closest friends that I had had this history with and had been maybe competitive with or am still competitive with, People can't just impose anybody they want on a creative collaboration. It's not fair, um, and it's not. It wasn't fair for me after working with these guys for a year to start bringing in some of their friends without understanding the social dynamic that they had with their friends, and without acknowledging the fact that hierarchies had been sort of sorted out within within this group, within us, within within the adults in the group, and within the young people. And we understood the the dynamic there, and it had it evolved this natural dynamic, and to suddenly bring in these other young people who were already had a history with 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 um, the people in the collective would was not fair and that eventually made complete sense just and again with the analogy of okay if somebody brought in somebody that I was friends with it would be tough um, so we started to do uh, projects to include other people um, how to hook up is one where we um, we are connecting up so this is where we are in Parkdale um, and these are the so-called priority neighborhoods in Toronto that have been identified uh, by the United Way in the City of Toronto as being particularly needy. This followed a bunch of um, uh, uh, spates of gun violence between predominantly um, uh, African diaspora kids. And so we did a project where we focused on um, making video, uh, small short videos about the different arts organizations, youth arts organizations out in, in the neighborhood. And again, that put a, uh, also trying to put a bit of a spin in a, uh, on the relatively typical uh, way of working with young people where you ask them to make a very personal uh, autobiographical video as being kind of one of the first things you uh, that's often done in those kinds of situations and I wanted to do something where they instead of focusing on their se them themselves they started to focus on other people and they were the hosts of the video and we made very we were very careful that they were also showcased in the video as hosts and as as the production team but it was it was all about actually I mean it was also it was more about showcasing these other people um, and sort of doing both at the same time, but wanting them to get their heads around that and also get their hands around the sort of sociological aspect and the socioeconomic aspect of the city and for them to understand the sort of dynamics in the city uh, was part of that. Um, so right now we're, we're a company in residence at the Gladstone Hotel and uh, part of that is the, um, you can, uh, oh yeah, there's the Gladstone Hotel. Um, and then 
the, the, if you can see on the side, the Torontonians are the teenagers in residence, and that's official. Uh, it's, as far as I know, it's the first hotel in the world to have teenagers in residence officially. And then we're the company in residence um, at the hotel. So, so that's what we're doing. In the, but the main thing that we're doing that I've kind of held back on mentioning is that it's, um, it's a secession plan for the company. We've been working with them since they were nine years old. Uh, they're 17 years old now. And we are hoping that some of them um, take over uh, aspects of the company, take over leadership roles in the company, artistic production, administrative leadership roles um, within the company. And we're training them to do that. And the Young Mammals is the wing of the company where we're doing this training. Um, and, and hoping to expand the company so that I don't have to, I don't lose my job, I just sort of get a different job that is less artistic and more um, trying to build a sort of a consultative wing so that I can offer different kinds of services, um, do more research services. I'm just finishing a master's in urban planning that focuses, my, my thesis focused on on um, the use of culture and youth youth arts as, as, as economic development. So that takes me into sort of almost the end of this um, presentation where what we're doing right now is this secession model that's based on the young people and this model is something we're trying to share with um, the, um, the the Ruhrgebiet which is a, a region in Germany um, it's a if you were viewing it from a satellite you would see that it, it looks like the biggest city in Germany um, but it's a bunch of uh, smaller cities that are all sort of um, that, that are all together in the same region it's a region where coal and steel was produced coal was extracted and steel was produced um, uh, sort of back in the day it's, it's where Marx saw a lot of what sort of inspired him to write what he did um, and right now it's they've taken all of these large uh, steel factories um, and turned them into opera houses and it was the the uh, European uh, cultural capital in 2010 and tons and tons of resources went into the region um, and so now um, we're working with um, the uh, 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 what's it, uh, 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 Urbana Kunsturur and the Culture Ruhr. These are two organizations that that, um, that are kind of central to making the, the stuff happen. They, they run the Ruhr Triennale which is this very large um, international performing arts festival, the one that uh, Robert Wilson was in. Um, and so we're trying to work with them to work with these young people that we started working on the, with the Children's Choice Awards in 20. 12, um, we're trying to work with them to do something similar uh, as what we're doing with the Torontonians in Toronto, um, except we're trying to find them internships within the, the various organizations that are part of the Culture Ruhr umbrella, um, and then any other arts organizations kind of in the region, and then we have a commitment to come back at least twice a year to do projects with them um, and to sort of build that. Now, I have a small uh, ethical concern about that. Um, Having been, I'm 48 years old now, and I, I don't think I made, I, I mean, I know I didn't make over $20,000 a year until I was in my 40s, so I've spent most of my life um, uh, quite poor. And so inviting young people into something like that, is that something I should be doing um, when maybe they should sort of, I don't know, be a plumber and actually make a living. Um, so I wanted to look at that and that was part of my master's research was to take a look at that kind of thing and, and what seems to be happening, at least this is what some people are claiming, um, is that things are changing and so um, this is, comes from uh, the Cambridge Journal of Regions, Economy and Society and the, the March 2013 um, issue was called Creatives After the Crash and it was all these people writing about the creative industries and so a number of points I took from this that seem kind of important that there's a long-term structural change occurring in the economy that favors the cultural industries that seems to be a fait accompli that's happening um, Richard Flora was kind of more or less right depends on what we're, where we're talking about um, it, it varies from city to city some cities are ridiculous to try to do this some cities it makes sense to try to do this um, the Ruhrgebiet is is probably makes sense to do this, think about things in this way, the Ruhr region. Um, the demand for culture remains high even with smaller household budgets uh, than most other, oops, no, something's fucked up. Oh yeah, you can see, okay, okay, you can see, sorry, you see, one got bumped up. Ignore that line. So the demand for culture remains high even with smaller household budgets. So what economists are finding is that is that the money that people have for necessities, culture and partaking in the cultural life of the city um, is becoming an economic, is becoming a, a, a life necessity. People are, are using their necessity dollars for that kind of thing. Um, and if you just think about the way people live their lives now in the city, that seems to be obvious. Um, and the creative industries survived the economic crisis of 2008 better than most other sectors. That's what economists are, that are writing in this have, have said. And this one is the most interesting one for me. Um, 
uh, jobs in the cultural industries are more resistant to economic fluctuation than service retail and lower end manufacturing jobs, which um, is where many of these young people are are likely headed um, if you if you're thinking realistically about um, you know the, the the children of the Turkish guest workers the kinds of lives that they have ahead of them um, these jobs in the cultural industries are are looking okay the thing about it is though that the reason why they're looking okay and Heather McLean wrote uh, her her um, and she's a Torontonian a friend of mine um, her article in this um, uh, uh, journal focuses very much on the necessity for um, for the social networks that are in the culture industries and and how the role that they play in all of this so if you think of a, a typical service sector job if a service sector job disappears because of the economy the idea that your your friends might be doing a project another service sector job that you could sort of part, partake in is just that's not something that happens whereas in the cultural industries that happens all the time people surf from gig to gig through their social connections the thing is, the young people that we're dealing with, they don't um, have these kinds of social connections. They don't have social connections within the cultural industry. So we're trying to, to sort of help them build those and participate um, in building those through these projects. Um, I'm going to skip this for a bit. So this is these are just some photos of the young people that uh, we're working with in the Roga Beat. Um, and we just did the Children's Choice Awards a couple years ago, or the, in 2012. And then the next thing I wanted to do was a creative project with them so that we just all had a bunch of fun. And then we'll start to worry about the internships around production and stuff. And we did something called Small Talks in Daft Hell, which is something we're continuing to develop where I just in, invited them to treat adults the way they felt like treating them. And so they bullied them for uh, about 45 minutes. So there's a few pictures there. Um, so we're trying to um, roll. We're trying to work with these young people, and then we're also hoping to roll it in. And this is all in the kind of um, early stages of uh, of conception, which is we're trying to work with. We have some interest from a researcher at the London School of Economics, um, who is wanting to help us figure out um, outcomes around this. Um, uh, economic outcomes are is something good happening by working with these young people and and trying to. Um, with the secession model of, of um, youth engagement. And then also um, subjective well-being is another question. Um, economic well-being is one thing, but subjective well-being is also very, very important. Are people happy? Um, are we making lives better with this? So that's one of the things that we're hoping to do. Now within the, the work that we're doing, um, some of the operating principles that are really important um, is that, that um, adults do not exist. Um, there's there's a recent sort of surge in the study of the sociology of childhood where people understand that, that the notion of a child and what is a child is 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 you know contingent it's a, it's historically contingent it's spatially contingent different cultures um, think of children are different things at different times um, sometimes people are not children when they're 14 years old sometimes they are children when they're 14 years old so what is a child is really really variable what I think is that is that actually what is an adult is very very much is as variable and that these this idea of a rational um, uh, rational fair person who is um, uh, mature I've never met one I don't know what they are um, and so treating understanding that everybody is is essentially childlike and everybody's a neophyte when they're coming to sort of figuring out life that's one principle um, another thing is that uh, a, lo a lot of work these days with young people really, really positions sh uh, children in leadership roles. There's a lot of uh, I talk to many, many curators who have this. It's like they, it's like the first, like they're they think they're the first person to think of this. I'm going to get this kid to curate my entire program for me. I'm going to get these kids to do a do all of this curation for me. I think it's I think that that's unfair. Um, I think it's abdicating a bit of responsibility. But what I do think is that is that young people are really, really great at coming up with really, really. Um, uh, spectacular content that is kind of new and unusual um, just in their kind of ordinary interactions with the world um, but at, it's adults who have an, under, an art historic understanding that they can bring to the situation that um, that is that is important to note so when we work with them they will often provide content but we will often acknowledge our role in providing form and we're not embarrassed about that it's not about giving children and young people the full reign and letting them lead everything there is a collegiality that that happens Stealth pedagogy. I've also I've already mentioned. What is it kind of like? 
if, you, if you talk at Creative Time, at the Creative Time Summit, they actually turn your microphone off. So I thought maybe that's what was happening. Um, stealth pedagogy is just the idea that, that we're, it's actually the adults that we're concerned about with. Collegiality and friendship, the young people are seen as our colleagues and the projects are easily just as important to our lives and careers as adults, the adults on the project as it is to them, maybe even more so, and that friendship is another operating um, principle. We, we are their friends and we, we acknowledge that there is, the, there is a sort of boundary challenge and a kind of um, idea that maybe that's not the best thing to do, um, but we've been doing it really pretty solidly since 2010 and not had any problems. My apartment is, is open, they come over, they, we have uh, gatherings at my apartment. In fact, there's 17 now, so when I'm away, um, there's about five of them that have keys to my apartment. I have on my, they buzz in through my phone, so I know who's coming. They have to book it with me first. Um, so they book it with me through online, through Facebook, and then, and then I buzz them in, so I kind of have some idea of what's going on. But they have keys and they do whatever they want in my apartment. It's up to them. Um, they're old enough. Um, so. And then social capital, we share our social capital with them, our networks with them. And um, performativity is also really super important. Um, and by performativity, I don't mean, often performativity is a, it becomes a synonymous with just performance somehow. Something's performative if it's just somebody performing. I think that's a, that's a misuse of the word, um, a misuse of one understanding of the word. Performativity, that idea comes from um, speech act theory, from what I understand. And a performative speech act is, is, is something that you say that actually changes the world. So the famous, uh, the sort of most common example is, I now pronounce you man and wife. Um, when you say that, suddenly legal relationships are completely changed. Um, there's, you, you know, there's the, your, your relationship to the government and taxation changes. Um, lots of things change when those words are spoken. And so performativity is, is doing something that then, that then and changes, actually changes reality. Performance of gender is also understood as that. So that's also, and that ties exactly into what, what Steve was saying. Um, so I think I'm going to finish. I think that that's good enough. There was there was other thing that I was going to say, but I'll talk to you all personally one-on-one uh, -on -one about this other thing that I'll tell you about. All right, thanks a lot.